Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk about cyberpunk, specifically its relationship with film noir. Well, it's easy to assume that this relationship is the result of the success of Blade Runner, and it partially is. I'd argue that cyberpunk would have gotten a relationship with film noir even if Blade Runner never existed. At its heart, cyberpunk is a middle ground between two extremes on emerging technologies, a reflection on the growing accessibility of high technology and how that would change culture. In the same vein, film noir's sense of cynicism is a consequence of so many returning from the First World War and how it changed their outlook. The key in both is a cultural change due to a paradigm shift. Being brought on by a war, or by technology, the result is the same. I bring up this relationship to highlight something not quite addressed in the likes of cyberpunk giants like Shadowrun and Cyberpunk 2020. As respectable as both of those games are in their own right, this film noir relationship is minimized in favor of the technological bent. As nice as that is, I'd hardly want that to be the be-all, end-all example of how cyberpunk should be handled. Enter Tech Noir, a game that styles itself as high-tech and hard-boiled. How does it hold up? Does it manage to bring the noir aspect to the forefront? Well, let's find out. Visual identity is something I've focused on a lot lately, and Tech Noir is no exception. At 214 pages, it's stylized in the way many rules-like games are, with generous spacing and a to-the-point attitude about it. I also like the mix of futurized photographs throughout the book, consistently using the blue and white color pattern that's in the rest of the book. Last but not least, an index. Solid work here. Character creation, as outlined in the procedure chapter, is an exercise of life path like words instead of numbers for the most part. We'll be exploring that with Akihiro Amaral, an odd jobs guy who's taken to private security work. The first step involves choosing three training programs, which delve into their training background through verbs and adjectives. We'll get into the details of both later, but for now we have to pick three training programs and one adjective for each. Taking the concept into account, we'll go with Soldier, Investigator, and Bodyguard. This gives us a spread of two in Coax, two in Detect, three in Fight, two in Hack, two in Move, two in Prowl, two in Shoot, and two in Treat. From the three adjective pools, we'll go with Brave, Intuitive, and Patient, which are noted as Locked. While it's possible to pick a training program twice, we've elected not to do so here. Next, we select three connections, people or groups that the character knows well enough to do favors or services for them. Each of these have a set of adjectives associated with them chosen from a list. Our three connections in this case are All A's Security, Catherine Dolom, and Jiro each granting a set of favors and adjectives respectively. Lastly, equipment. Each character starts with 10 creds to purchase starting objects. Technoir is equivalent to an equipment system. Because of our connections, we gain one implant object for free. That said, we'll be starting with reflex simulators, a Kevlar vest, a Barker pistol, and a med kit. Having upgraded the pistol twice and the reflex stimulators once, we are left with one cred. As I said before, character creation is rooted more in words than it is in numbers, which might set off those averse to story games. I'd say there's still enough choice to avoid the story game trap, but my only real issue here is the fact that details on connections and objects could use better examples to minimize page jumping. Nitpicks aside, the wording is clearly meant to help nudge you into building your character idea, which is likely why I'm willing to give it a pass here. Tech Noir uses a D6 dice pool based around the four pillars. Verbs, adjectives, push, and hurt. Verbs are similar to attributes and skills in other games, and is the root action that you'll be utilizing, generating the primary set of dice. Adjectives are the method of interaction through verbs, as well as acting as positive and negative conditions. These are within three rankings. Fleeting, which lasts as long as their circumstances. Sticky, which lasts throughout the scene and locked, which are mostly permanent. Push is the closest thing this game has to extra effort, each character having three push die to start. These die start out charged, but are discharged to apply roles where objectives, objects, and tags can apply, or they can be spent to apply adjectives to a target. Hurt die are similar to wounds in other games, 
and cancel out verb or push dice. These dice are generated by negative adjectives. After assembling the appropriate amount of d6, you roll a combination of verb, push, and hurt die. The hurt die cancel out any results that match theirs, i.e. a hurt die of 4 cancels out a verb or push die result of 4. After the hurt die are resolved, the highest die result is the final rating for the roll. If there are multiples of that result, then the die roll is treated as adding a point 1 to it. This is compared against the reaction of the target, which is generated by the target's verb plus any push die discharge to add adjectives, objects, and tags. If the result beats the reaction, they apply a negative adjective and may spend die to increase the severity of that adjective. While the die system appears complicated at first, it's much simpler in practice. I do have a couple issues, however. Putting aside the situationalness in the mechanics, I think it's a little too reliant on push die to enhance the role and enhance defense. I do get the notion of the closed economy it's going for, since spending push die grants them to the player or GM, but the sticking point for me is the fact that you can discharge on reactions, even though you're supposed to have those die discharged after an action. Perhaps I'm misreading this, but I do think there's more tactical sense in having participants manage them like mana, where you don't dump what's not used. Additionally, I think the example negative adjectives are woefully inadequate. The book could do with a few more pages of example adjectives so people have an idea on how it's supposed to work. Technoir does not necessarily have adventures in the traditional sense. Instead, it has a story seed collection known as a transmission. Transmissions are composed of six parts called plot nodes that can interact with each other randomly or be determined by the participants. First, Connections, which are similar to the connections that we went over in character creation, each one having a set of leads that are either connected or unconnected to them. These leads might also be linked to other plot notes. Events are the major things that happen, the kind that you'd see on news feeds or might reflect the story at play. Factions are the moving and shaking groups that pressure the player characters. Typically, factions operate under an agenda. Locations are the interesting places that might come into play during sessions. Objects are the items of value within the story, and might be valuable to certain NPCs or factions. Lastly, threats are individuals and or groups that are used by connections or factions to carry out their agendas. All these nodes are arranged on the master table, but can be selected instead of rolling 2d6 as it shows. The first three are generated as the mission seed. This seed can be expanded on by the PCs invoking connections, which can be connected to the mission seed, and later play may add parts to the plot map through gameplay. To demonstrate a seed, I'll use the master table in the Twin Cities Metroplex transmission. We'll roll 2d6 th three times and check the master table. Since we rolled a 5 and 2, 6 and 5, and 2 and 4, the triangle is as follows. Cyberbody, Syndicate Assassins, and Sawyer Rose Incident. Through this, we could create a mystery story delving into why the boat sank, the Cyberbody acting as a Chekhov's gun in the story, and the assassins being hired to keep it under wraps. Of course, there's more stories that could be spun from this, it's merely a set of seeds. While the transmissions won't be for everyone, I think it further establishes the fact that Technoir is a very sandbox-leaning game focused on investigation. The fact that the transmission assumes the players will have its context might be contentious, but I could easily see ways around it. Story games, or narrativist games, depending on how you want to look at it, will always be a point of debate whether they count as a game or just a case of Mother May I. I don't fall into the latter personally. All I ask is that the game give a sufficient amount of mechanical choices to invest the participants. In this regard, I'd say Noir does provide enough choice, though it might be a bit too minimalistic for some. Even with my nitpicks, I still think the game can be forgiven for its dedication to being an investigation-based game. After all, I will respect any game that's dedicated to its goals. All things being equal, I feel confident in giving Technoir a grade of playable. That may seem a bit low, but it's in part because, much like Tefra, it does a poor job of explaining its finer mechanics. This is a game that is more cyber noir than cyberpunk, and I can't help but sense some will compare it to Shadowrun, and that's in no way fair. If you liked playing Clue in your younger days, or played the Android board game in your older days, Technoir will be right up your alley. Even beyond that, the transmissions are a fine tool for story generation. 